right, so welcome everybody. Uh, this, my name is Samuel Horvath and together with Peter Iktarik, Virginia Smith, Abrelin Bellat and Dal Alista, we are organizing a Flow Seminar, where Flow stands for Federated Learning One World Seminar, and it was created to provide a global online forum for the dissemination of the latest scientific research in all aspects of federated learning. Today we have our 59th talk, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Gal Cezic, who is a director of AI Research and NVIDIA, and is a professor at Bar Ilan University at Israel. His research funds algorithms, theory, and applications of deep learning with a focus on strong generalization, few shot and zero shot learning, and adaptation to novel domains, for example, in personalized federated learning. And a particular interest is in perception, action, and reasoning, and their intersection for the purpose of smart generalization. And his work won best paper awards in NAVRIPS and ICML. And today he's going to tell us about uh, how to use your hyper networks to personalize very learning. So thank you, Odgo, and please. Thank you so much. And thank everyone for, for coming. Uh, and thank you, Samuel, and the organizer for inviting me. And for this wonderful series of talks, it's amazing. I mean, 59 talks, and this, uh, it just uh, became a really super valuable uh, resource. So, um, I want to tell you about work that we've been doing in the past uh, year, year, year and a bit, um, about the problem of personalized federated learning and using hyper networks for that. So I, I'm, I, my talk is going to focus mostly on the content from a paper we published at ICML last year, um, again, about hyper network personalized federated learning. And then I'm going to talk more shortly during the talk about two extensions of that work. One is an extension for heterogeneous architectures, and this is in collaboration with our colleagues at NVIDIA. And the other is an extension to what we call a zero shot or inference time personal federated learning. And both were submitted, so I won't go into too many details. So in this audience, I, I probably don't need to motivate or explain very deeply what federated learning is about, but let's just say a few sentences just to set the context. In federated learning, we are interested to train a model, which is kind of sits maybe on a cloud in a server, but the data uh, is located at several different clients. And each client, they want to, do not want to reveal their data. They want to keep some privacy. Uh, they do not want to communicate a lot with the server, but you still want to train a joint model in a distributed way across all your clients. And of course, by sharing a cross client, you gain some better generalization because you have more data, et cetera. Now in, in federated learning, um, one, the, the, the objective is that we are trying to find a common model that works well on average on all the clients. So if you have a loss for the ith client, uh, with with the weights of the of the model, um, this is basically the expectation of data drawn from PI. That is the probability distribution of data in the client I. And overall, you're interested basically to minimize the average um, loss on on all clients. So here you're looking a single for a single model that works well on average on all clients. But of course, uh, different clients. Oh, and, and maybe I, I say, I, I can give just two examples of, uh, these are the, the, the common and, and famous example for where federated learning is useful. For instance, um, if you have different cell phones, every device could be a client, maybe you don't want to share the data. This is one example where the, each client is kind of a, a single person, a consumer or a single device. There are cases where a client could be a much larger entity. For example, if you think about what happened at the beginning of the epidemic, different hospitals, they wanted to diagnose COVID-19 using uh, chest x-rays. And, but there was very little labeled data for each hospital. So hospitals formed consortiums and kind of wanted to train a joint model to diagnose and detect COVID, of course, without sharing patient data, which they're not allowed to do. Now, as I said, in reality, uh, each client may have their own data distribution, right? 
if we talk about the examples of cell phones, so if you think about speech recognition on a cell phone, every person have a, has a different accent. Um, and, and actually, different people use different vocabularies, right? So there is a different distribution to every speaker in, in such a system. If you go back to the hospital example, uh, here as well, the distributions vary from one hospital to another. For example, uh, the patient distribution is different, right? They have different, may have different populations. They have, may, may have different x-ray machines. So again, the P of X is different. It's actually interesting. Also, sometimes the P of label given image might be different because different annotators or the, the different hospitals have different labeling procedures, more or less conservative. So, so again, the distribution could really vary across um, the different clients, both in terms of P of X, P of Y, P of Y given X, everything might change. And of course, we're interested to see how could we train personalized federated learning when you have models that are personalized per client. And needless to say, there's been a lot of work on this, uh, even in this series, uh, a lot of work, uh, several studies took a meta learning approach, for example, using MAML. Uh, there's another series of work to try to kind of combine local models per client with a global model that sits in the server and, and different ways to combine them. And I, I listed a few references here. There, there's, there are plenty more, and I'm sorry, I apologize to all authors that I somehow did not uh, manage to cite. And we, we do a much better job in the paper. So we, this was kind of my short background to federated learning and personalized federated learning that I assume this audience knows well about. I want to now spend just a couple of slides on this concept called hyper networks, which are less, less um, well known. Um, a hyper network is a deep network, but, but uh, it could be as any architecture of deep network. But what's interesting is its output. It's a deep network that produces weights for another deep network. So, as usual, you, you might have a hyper network here, H, parameterized with this psi. These are the network parameters. And the network receives as input some, some descriptor of a model. We'll talk about it in detail later. At this point, just think about it as an arbitrary index. And it outputs weights of another deep network. So these Ws are going to be used. So, so now you have your target network which is just a standard network. And you take those Ws and plug them into your network. And now you just do your usual thing. Given a, a, an input sample X, you have an output sample Y, and you can do inference with this model. So the, 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 the interesting part here is that you can train these two networks together jointly. And, and the reason is, if you look at y, the, the predicted output y, of course, this is a function of w, right? Uh, y hat is function of x and w, but w is a function of the hypernetwork parameters. So you can basically you do uh, the chain rule back propagation and, and back propagate the gradients of the loss with respect to the parameters of the hypernetwork. So you can as usual, you just backprop the gradients, and by computing loss in your in your target, you can update the parameters of the hyper network. Now, um, there there are a lot of papers on hyper networks. There are even hyper hyper networks, and as we will see, and I will demonstrate and illustrate that with um, in the context of federated learning, hyper networks allow you. Uh, kind of provide you with an interesting way to share information across several target networks. Okay, so so after this short introduction, uh, okay, we had we have personal federated learning, we have hyper networks. Let's see how we combine them. And I think the way we combine Sorry, them is actually yes. Yeah, there is a question in the chat, so I'll try to unmute. Yeah, should person. I open the chat or do you want to read it loud? No, I can. I'll try to unmute the person so they can ask oh, themselves. If not, I'll just read it loud for you. Oh, 
Hello, am I audible? Hi. Hey. Uh, so I was having this one doubt that uh, whatever that is being generated as the output of the hi uh, hyper network, like is it some kind of uh, gradient that can be updated to the server or it is something else? I, I, I'm sorry, could you repeat the, the last question? So the output of the hyper network, what's about it? Uh, like, according to me, like in federated learning, we kind of uh, update the gradient and we send them to the server. So, uh, and we update there also at the server and send back to the uh, local devices. Now, my question is like, whatever is being generated by the hyper network are the same gradients that are being transferred to and fro? That's a great question. I was just about to explain that. You, you're right, I still didn't explain. So far, I just kind of gave a background about what the hyper network is. And, and you're right, now we want to combine that with, uh, to use hyper network for federated learning. And I'll okay, explain sorry. that. No problem, no okay. problem. Was there a second, was there another question? No, this was the one. Okay, great. Okay. So how do we use hyper networks in the context of federated learning? So first, I think there's something really natural here. And that is the idea is that your hyper network is gonna be located at the server and it's gonna receive a descriptor, this vector of VI for a client I. And once it, it gets that, it's gonna produce weights for the client network. And if you have, for every client, you're gonna provide a different descriptor and you're gonna get a different weight vector. So now uh, the client can easily, you know, it has its model and it can do inference, uh, it can do inference here. So what happens now, the question that was already asked is very natural. Uh, how, how do you do, oops, how do you, how do you do learning here? And uh, once again, the client computed loss over W and it can send back gradients, only gradients for W and at the server, the hyper network can translate these gradients like further propagate the, the, with the chain rule and compute gradients over Psi. And so, so this way, the only the, the communication only involves gradients for the local model of the client and does not involve any gradients uh, for you know of the size of the hyper network. Maybe it's worth saying that often hyper networks are tend to be large um, because they need kind of there's there's like um, uh, some some base layers. And then they need to produce, and I'm going to talk about the architecture in a second. They need to produce weights for every um, for every layer of the target network. So they, they, these small the hyper networks tend to be pretty large, and I'm going to talk shortly about how we address that so the so the communication cost is not huge. But note that even if the hyper network has a lot of parameters, these are not communicated over the channel. Only the gradients for the model are communicated. Okay. So I, I, what's, what's probably nice about this architecture is that what, what the hyper network does, it basically learns kind of a family of personalized models. So models are personalized, they are different, but they, are, they have some information shared in a, in a smart and interesting way. Right, there is no like explicit or hard parameter sharing. There's no parameter that is explicitly shared across different clients, but all parameters of the different clients are produced by a single shared model. So the network, the hyper network, actually learns what should be shared across clients. And of course, um, if the representation of the hyper network is just, if it has too much expressivity, it might overfit to clients. But if you regularize it correctly, then you expect some generalization across clients because they all affect the parameters of the hyper network. 
And, and, and this we find, and I'll show you later, it actually allows you like a, a lot of diversity between clients, even though, you, so on one hand you share, on the other hand, you want to support diversity, heterogeneity. So basically the hyper network learns what should be shared and, and among which clients. So you have all the uh, flexibility of that. Okay. So one thing I didn't tell you was how do we choose the client descriptor? And that's pretty important. Well, if, if you have some strong domain knowledge, maybe you know something about all clients, maybe they, they belong to some classes or you know predefined structure over the client space, then maybe you can just manually predefine that. Um, but the alternative is that you actually learn the descriptor. So what, you, what you're gonna do is during training, you're gonna learn what model you produce for every client. And you're also gonna optimize the descriptor of every client. And this way, for example, you expect that if several, descript several clients have like similar distribution or maybe same classes or same distribution, you expect their descriptors to be more similar. And this would allow you better sharing there. Um, so the objective here becomes, again, you average over losses of, uh, of, the, of the client. Uh, and now you optimize both over the descriptors and over the, hyper, uh, the parameter of the hypernetic. I guess this is a good time for questions. I guess just if, please, if you have a question, just a reminder, please either post it to the chat or uh, then you can either raise your hand and I'll try to unmute you. So I'll have, uh, I, I can just quickly start with one question. So, uh, with uh, so one popular approach in, in federated learning is uh, for clients to run like a few local steps before they communicate the graduates back, and at least it's not straightforward to me how how this works for for hyper networks. Is it, exactly. is it also so possible? Th that's a great question because this is actually my next slide. You know, All right. sorry, it's yeah. always <laughs> yes. That's a great question. Um, and, 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 and you're right, uh, it has been shown that this helps stabilize the gradients. You get a better estimate of the gradients of every client and it actually improved training. Um, so what, what we basically did was that every client computes several, and, and I have the full algorithm here. Mm -hmm. um, so every client uh, samples uh, several mini batches and uh, computes its own gradients. Here, here theta is for W. Uh, so these are going to be the updates of the, the client parameters. And you repeat that for some number of local rounds. And, and then you kind of aggregate the, the gradient and you send just the aggregate to the, to the server, to the hyper network. And the hyper network computes uh, an update based on all the aggregated uh, gradient. What, what I'm showing on the right, let me just, sorry, I'm moving the, the zoom uh, window. What's showing on the right is that uh, indeed, if you do some aggregate, this is for one step, but there's no aggregation. But once you do a larger number of local steps, um, training happens faster, it's more stable. And of course, it also saves you some communication, right? Because you don't send gradients every step, but every hundred steps. Yeah, thank you. So, just so, so you do actually the step with respect to local, uh, with respect to like the local parameters, or, or you just kind of improve the what is this? Yeah. So, so, so you actually yeah do multiple local steps. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I think there was a one. Hands up, but I cannot see anymore. I think it was from Kiran Deep to, was your question answered Kiran Deep or it was, uh, let me just try to unmute you. Um, I just had this query, like 
when you are saying it is a client descriptor basically it is also a model in itself na no? um well at, at a later point in the talk i will describe a, a, an extension where there is a model that learns the descriptor but but here you just you can think about um the descriptor just as a point in space think about think about embeddings like like you do word embeddings or something right so so you have a space of clients and and basically you try to move these clients in space and it would work well if you aggregate right if you if you if all clients that are similar would move to the same part of space okay right so so the the descriptors what i described so far they are just like there's no model behind it they're just uh, dense vectors that you that you shift in space thank you that's a that's a great question okay um so let me continue um you know uh we I'll, I'll go very quickly about this. Uh, and if you're interested, you'll find more uh, details in the paper. Uh, we just to mention that we we uh, wrote a generalization bound following a work by Baxter that was uh, developed for multitask learning. And, and this is a kind, kind of a, the usual generalization bound. You have sample complexity. And it tells you kind of a bound on sample complexity. How much samples do you need such that your generalization, right, your empirical loss is close enough to your, uh, to your uh, generalization loss. Um, and, and the point is that um, what's written in this bound, there are a few interesting things. One of them is that you have a component that decays with the number of samples, but there's also a component that does not. And, and this is this is interesting. The, the second thing is that there are a lot of Lipschitz constants here that basically measure, um, you know, uh, for example, LV measures the the size of your embedding, of, right? The the space of those descriptor embedding, and so this kind of captures how how flexible uh, the representation of the of the descriptors uh, could be, and this of course affects. Uh, generalization. So this was just to mention, you know, very briefly, if you're interested, there are more details in the paper. Now, I, I want to point out an, an extension that I think touches on something important. In, in federated learning, and, and there's a lot of work on how do you combine models that are global, right, because you care about sharing across clients, with models that are local, because you want personalization. So here we have a lot of that taken care of by the hyper network, right? We have both sharing and personalization, but, but you still could add some component that is completely local to a client. So for instance, uh, you could have your hyper network produce part of the network for the target network, the client network. And let's say add some some final layers on top of that that are specific to a, a, a client. They are not shared, and they are just completely local to a client. And here are a few examples where where this would be useful. Imagine you have uh, clients with basically the same labels, but they were named differently, so you'll have different order. Well, you 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 don't you just need a last layer to to fix that order, um, or if if you have uh, some some clients adding or removing some classes, then this could be really handled by um, the last layers. The early layers should still be shared. The feature extractor, the, the representation should probably be the same, but maybe you won't kind of have these late fixes that you apply to each client. So now we, we simply did that by, as you see in this, in this image, we added several layers that are specific to each client. So this is omega i in addition to wi. So now every client has two types of personalized weights, ws that are generated by the hyper network, and this omega i, which are fully local. And we call this a personalized classifier, PC. So the optimization now becomes 
you optimize over psi, over bedding vectors, and also about over omegas. OK, so uh, unless there are any urgent questions, let me show you how it works. OK. Um, so first, we compared with um, uh, several recent uh, personalized approaches. Uh, I'm going to show you the, the personalized federated hypernetwork hours and the variant with the personal omega i. Um, we also looked at what happens when you just train completely locally without collaboration. You expect that to work worse. Uh, we compared with you know the the canonical federal averaging, which is not a personalized model, just a single model, and several other personalized approaches, uh, the mammal-based um, and recent uh, PFEDME, LGA, FEDAV, and FEDPER, um, all are recent personalized approaches. We looked at three data sets, um, the very common vision data set CIFAR-10, then CIFAR-100, and also at Omniglot. I, I, let me assume that everyone knows CIFAR-10. Basically, you have these 10 classes with small images. Uh, about six, uh, The total data set is 60,000, so you have 6,000 per class. And with CIFAR-100, you have uh, 100 classes, so you still have 600 images per class. Omniglot is an interesting data set of, of uh, handwritten characters. It has 50 different alphabets, and you have 20 samples um, per, uh, per, per character. Uh, OK. It's always, always fun to see unknown alphabets. Um, so here's the, we followed the experimental protocol from a previous paper. And the, the idea is to create clients that have some variability, some heterogeneity in their distribution. So here's the, here's the protocol. I just described it. We didn't invent it. Um, I describe it for CIFAR 10. So you start by sampling two classes, pairs of classes. So pair, 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 and pair. So every client has two classes out of 10. Then what you do for every client and class you sample a number uniformly in this range, and then you assign that fractions of the samples to that class. Okay, um, so so this means you basically let's say you have for for some of the class, uh, let, let's say for the first class you have that number of samples, and now you kind of assign them to different clients. So the result of that is that you have heterogeneity across clients in the class proportions and in the number of samples. And we repeated that using 10 and 50 and 100 clients. So when you have more clients, you have less samples per client. So that's, that's the way to, to think about the results I'm gonna show you. More clients means fewer, less samples per clients, so you need more sharing. The protocol for Omniglot was, was simple. We just had a client per alphabet. And as you've seen from, from this, uh, with this image, there's a lot of variability across alphabets. They tend to be much, much more different because we don't share, as we didn't see for, we don't share classes. Okay. Um, we used really simple architecture for the uh, hyper network, just three uh, layer, fully connected layer. And the hyper network has multiple heads, and it has a head for every target weight tensor. So there's there are a lot of uh, shared layers, and there is head for the different target uh, layers. And the, the client network, we use the same as the baseline. This was, these were variants of Linnet. So um, not, not surprisingly, we found that this work, uh, this, the hyper networks uh, worked um, Consistently better than baselines, the the personal the the version that has this personalized this local classifier usually worked better, and especially it worked better with Omniglot, and and this makes sense because indeed Omniglot 
has larger heterogeneity across uh, classes uh, in you know in the in the way uh, they're written so it, it, it makes sense that we can gain more by having a local component that is not shared and we also in general see a better improvement when um, with with the uh, with more clients, so you share across. Uh, you, you know, every client has fewer samples, so you you improve. Let's say compared to uh, these baselines, you improve much more when you have more clients. Um, some ablation, some design choices. We tested that this is uh, robust. We tested um, how many hidden layers the hyper network should have. The embedding dimension was you know, there was not not really sensitive to, to that. Okay. Um, so I, I talked quite a lot about these personal models, about these, um, these local omega eyes, right? Now, there's a question, once you have, once you have local model, local components, then you think that it's possible that what, what the system now does it is that it the hyper network is just going to take care of everything that is shared and all personalization perhaps goes to the to the omegas right to the parts that are local so the, the question now is well if you have local components is there still heterogeneity in what the hyper network produces or would it just produce the same thing for, for all clients? So we did this um, to answer that. Um, maybe let me just rephrase that. If you think about the hypernetic as like a feature extraction layer, and on top of that, you have omega classifiers, is the feature extraction different for different clients? So to test that, we did this uh, mix and match experiment. So we train, we train, for several clients, and then we take two clients and we, we swap their feature extraction layer with another client. So of course, if they're all the same, there would be no drop in performance. Um, and, and what we see here, sorry, I'm still, I still need to move uh, the zoom. Okay. Um, so what I'm showing here, is the results, there's the original client, there's the swapped client. And sometimes when you swap, you really hurt uh, the classifier. So for example, if you try to classify automobile versus cat, but you plugged in the feature extractor for ship versus airplane, you're really in the black zone. Um, however, um, if you are, let's see, um, I don't, um, oh, this is a nice one. You have ship versus airplane, and it's actually okay if your feature extraction was trained for truck versus bird. Presumably, both in bird images and in airplane images, there are a lot of skies. So it's okay if you have this feature extractor and, and try to uh, classify this pair. So this tells us that, um, what the hyper network does, it does learn the feature structure layer, right? The, the WIs in a way that, that fits well uh, every client. So it, it is flexible where it needs to be. Okay. And then another interesting uh, uh, thing we wanted to look at was we are learning the descriptors. And I was trying to motivate that by saying that if we have clients that are similar, we would expect their descriptors to move to be close to each other in space. And this way, the network can generalize, right? It sees close descriptors. It knows it needs to generate similar weights. So what we did here was to, uh, this is a T-SNE visualization of the, of the embedding of the representation of the descriptors V. This was for CFR 100. 
And we use the fact that uh, in C4100, you have kind of a hierarchy of classes. Um, so all the, so all these are medium mammals. Uh, you, you have several fish, right? You have classes uh, group into some larger classes. And indeed what we find uh, that the embedding that is learned by the hypernetwork, right, uh, jointly does capture a lot of this um, semantic structure. Uh, all the fish are together, uh, I don't know, household furniture together, et cetera. Maybe that's a good time to, to see if people have questions about the past few, past few slides. I would have maybe one, like two quick ones. So I, I think I, I missed, like how do you exactly for those clients, how do, uh, how do you create this model descriptor? For, so for you, yourself? yeah, you, you just, um, you treat each one of them as a vector and you just shift it around, just move it around. So you push gradients to the embedding vector, to the dense vector. Um, this is a bit uh, just for the audience, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, in adversarial training, people sometimes fix the model W and they try to look for an X, right? For an input that is, that uh, I don't know, uh, maximize the objective or something. So in a way, this is similar. You, you move your inputs to the way it, so you minimize your loss. And then one other. So with respect to like hyper networks, like adding hyper networks on top of like you already like you already have a model. It seems like kind of to be uh, quite like a strong hammer. So so I, I wanted to ask like how do you take care of uh, tuning because there's like a lot of degrees of freedom. So do you think that is so so is does it require like a lot of engineering? or kind of there are like good ways that would mean like in most of the cases work? Yeah, th that's a great question. Um, so uh, this required less engineering than I expected. Um, I would say that the, the tricky part could be initialization. You know, in, in standard network, we have good understanding of how you initialize, right? You, you have this Xavier, you need to normalize, everything should be in the dynamic range of the, your values. In hypernetwork, it's a bit unclear because you want to generate weights that are themselves good initializers, right? So uh, there are some papers about that. Uh, one approach that we recently did, we didn't publish it yet, um, was the following trick and it, and it worked well. The idea was start by training your target networks without any sharing, not, not federated learning, just train your clients. And now you have a model, you have Ws. And now train your hyper network to produce those Ws. Um, and this gives you a, a good initialization of, of the hyper network. So uh, it, it, it worked okay for us uh, in, in some projects. I should say that in this work, the architecture of the hyper network was relatively simple and, and, and it, it was not like huge engineering efforts. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for a great question. Um, so, okay, so let me switch to a slightly different uh, setup. And that is what happens uh, you know, you had your set of clients, but suddenly, well, another client comes in. Uh, it has its data. What do you do? Well, you could you could just retrain everything. Uh, and of course, this is costly. And one idea is, well, if we already have a good hyper network, we could just we could just train its embedding vector. Let's just find the right embedding vector for it. So you, once, ag once again, the setup is as following. You have a new client. It has label data, X and Ys. And you can compute losses for this client and use them to modify the embedding vector 
the descriptor for that client. Um, so this is exactly what we did. Uh, we basically took um, CIFAR 10, uh, we had, this is probably CIFAR 100, sorry. Train on some clients, test on other like 10 novel clients. And um, what you can see here that um, we, we measure how different the new client is from existing clients. Of course, it did not participate in training. So if it's different from training clients, then you're going to perform worse. And indeed, if you measure how different the new client is from the training clients using total variation, you see that the accuracy drops the, the more different it is. Uh, but still, it is better than, than, than baselines that we tried. OK. Here's another, here's another case. Um, so far, we talked about personalization in terms of data. Different clients had different data, but they all share the same architecture. What happens if they have slightly different architectures? Now, we think there are several reasons why this could happen. Uh, if you think about cellular devices, maybe different edge devices have uh, you know, stronger hardware than others. So maybe you, your clients have different, you know, different memory, different compute, they need different architectures. Uh, with the hospital example, I think this is even more common because different hospitals may have different, uh, you know, legal processes, accreditation, uh, or maybe they have different legacy systems. So just because they've been working with some system and they cannot change their architecture. So not, it, it's, a, it's a good question of how do you, could you do personalized learning where clients have different architectures? So I'm gonna talk about two aspects of that problem. First, and this was published in our ICML paper. We, we did something simple. We just had different heads for different uh, architectures. So the same hyper network could generate, some of it was shared and some of it could generate uh, just uh, different uh, weights for different target uh, networks. And what I'm showing here, so we had, you know, small and medium and large networks. The difference was just the number of channels, the kernels in the convolution networks of the Lenet. And um, you see that this, uh, this approach actually uh, really adapts well to this uh, heterogeneity in architectures, both on CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. Now, let me tell you about uh, another step here. And this is work that we did not publish yet, so it's kind of in progress. Uh, and this is joint work with Oli Tani, David Akuna Morero, Hagai Maron, Sonia Fiddler, and Jan Kautz. And here, the idea is let's take that like a step further. What happens if your clients really have different architectures, but they, there are a lot of components that are shared? Think, think for example, I'm, I'm just going to show an example here. Think that you have a, a ResNet and it has all these skip locks and skip connection and all these layers. Uh, and, and some clients have some of these components in some ordering and other clients have slightly different architecture. What you would like to do is to provide a descriptor to the hyper network, a descriptor that captures the architecture. So the, what we did here was we looked at the architecture of the deep network and described it using a graph. And the graph, basically, every node in the graph is a, is a layer. And every edge between two layers, uh, so every edge between two nodes corresponds to you know, one layer feeds the other layer. So what we do here is we give as a descriptor a graph representation of the architecture. The hyper network is a, a graph neural network. So it knows how to consume a graph. And then you produce weights for every type of layer. So if you have a confnet, you produce some weights. If you have a uh, uh, you know pooling layer, you produce other network, other uh, weights, etc. 
and uh, we tested this. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be brief here. Um, there are several variants of these architectures that use kind of mix and match of components, and the the fewer the less data that you have, um, the, the gap between our approach and and baselines um, is larger. So it, it succeeds to some extent to use weights from different components in different architectures. Okay. So I, I, I know I'm going through a lot of uh, extensions to this idea. Um, and here's the, the last one. I told you about this case of, of you know, you finish training a model and now comes another client. Let's say this happens again, but now comes another client that, oops, wait, um, that doesn't have any label data. So imagine again, it's the beginning of COVID, uh, several hospitals all, you know, classify together uh, their patients. And now comes another hospital and says, oh, well, I have a lot of patients, but I don't have any labels yet. Can I use your model? You already trained something. How can I use your model? So this is tricky because previously what we could do, we could use the labels of the new client to train an embedding vector. Now you have nothing. This is like zero shot. Someone comes to you with data and asks for a model, but they don't have any labels. Okay, I, I'm trying to stress how magical this would be. So the idea is that, so you have your model trained on all these, and now this zero shot client, what can you do to help this zero shot client if you don't have, if it doesn't have any label data. So what you could do is you could prepare in advance to that setup. You could train your original hyper network in the following way. What we do is that we add a, a client encoder. So previously what we did was to train the descriptor jointly and now we do something slightly different. We train this module, and this module takes as an input a batch of samples. Could be a large batch, could be the whole data, but could be a, a batch of samples. And it outputs a, a descriptor for the hypernetwork. Basically, it, it kind of it makes sense, right? You 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 look at the data, and then you kind of understand what type of of distribution it is, what type of model you need for that. And you summarize the data using this dense descriptor. And of course, you can train everything jointly, right? Uh, because they're all, again, back pocket uh, chain rule. Now at, at, at inference time, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Your new client comes, they don't have labels, but they have an unlabeled data. You give that to your client encoder and it gives you a model descriptor. The hyper network gives you a model for that descriptor and you give it to your new client and everyone's happy. Let me also point out that this new client, it, it actually benefits from having high level of privacy because uh, it actually doesn't, it, it needs to send very little to the server. So the server could send it to the client encoder. The client takes a batch or it's all data, takes a batch, produces its vector, it's a descriptor V, uh, sends only the descriptor V to the server and gets a model. So in fact, you can show, and, and we wrote a, a small differential privacy result that depending on the properties of the encoder, you can add noise uh, such that uh, there is differential privacy. Um, the client does not reveal information about specific instances in its data when it sends the descriptor to the server. And um, so I'm showing you here the empirical results. Uh, again, the, the farther, the, the more different the novel client is, uh, your accuracy drop, of course, because you need to generalize from clients in the training, uh, but it was better than, than, than our baselines. Um, 
and and we compared so so in a way you can compare to a, a federated learning model not personalized one and and that model basically you know you have a single model so you can apply also to the new client but that of course works works worse uh when you have when the distribution of the new client is different um and there's uh with the more interesting data real data the advantage is more pronounced okay um i think we're towards the end almost uh, out of time we have we'll, we're going to have a few time for questions so let me conclude i described to you an approach based on hyper networks to do personalized federated learning uh, it provides what I, I feel is a natural way to share information across clients that still is flexible and personalized. And I, I, um, I highlighted like three extensions. So the basic one is that the hypernetwork learns a family of personalized models. And by learning a descriptor per client, um, you, you, you kind of, uh, understand the structure, this manifold of clients, and you can generalize better or share better across clients. The second point was that we have several, we have evidence that we can also use that to personalize the architecture of clients. So different clients use different architectures. And finally, we, by learning this client encoder, we can even produce a model for like a zero shot client, zero shot data set. And uh, I find it magical. Someone comes to you with some data, they have no labels and they just tell you, hey, uh, can you do something? And yes, the hyper network gives it a, a model back. So um, thank you all for, for listening and thank you for, thank you for the great questions. Let me just thank quickly my collaborators, uh, Ethan Fetaya, uh, which is, um, a very close collaborator and uh, worked on all these uh, projects. Chagai Maron at NVIDIA, Amir Globalzon from Tel Aviv University, Oli Tani, uh, David, Sanya, and Jan from NVIDIA, and my students, Aviv, Aviv, Ohad, Idan, and Dvir. And this was funded by Israeli Fund, uh, Science Foundation and Israeli Innovation Authority. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Gal, for an excellent talk. So please, if you have any question or comments, just feel free to pause your question to chat or just uh, raise your hand and then I'll try to unmute you. So maybe I would start with one. So you talk a bit about uh, about differential privacy of, of this uh, new client, but I was wondering also whether the actual training itself is kind of, uh, can be used like in conjunction with things like a secure aggregation or one could use like differential privacy on top of that so you kind of you can guarantee that not only like the new clients have some privacy guarantees but also the clients that participate in the in the training they also don't reveal any sensitive data yeah um i i, I want to be careful because we didn't study that in depth and and and, and privacy is uh is is really a tricky part um I, what, what we could do i think for the for the novel client it has some advantage because it doesn't participate in training uh it, it has this special special ability right um it turns out that you know um it depends on the properties of the encoder uh right on kind of a lipschitz properties of the encoder uh it means that if you do enough perturbation to your input you can uh, sorry, uh, the, the trade-off is as follows. You can hide some of specific instances in the input to your encoder by adding noise. Uh, but of course, when you add noise, you might hurt your performance. Uh, what we show is that, uh, you know, depending on the Lipschitz constants of your uh, encoder, then you can still get something, uh, something reasonable. It could still work under uh, some reasonable privacy uh, assumptions. Um, so this is for the novel client. For the for the the clients that participate in training, I don't we I don't have results 
uh, for that. And, and I, I'm careful not to speculate too much. So I was just wondering whether, like, because I, I might have missed it, but maybe like whether you can use kind of like techniques as a secure aggregation, or can you guarantee that the information that is like sent to the server who updates yeah. uh, this global hyper network is only aggregated and doesn't like accept of this uh, client embedding that doesn't, doesn't contain anything that's like specific yeah. to the client. I think I think it's a very interesting direction. We didn't we didn't uh, do that, but this is this would be really interesting to do. Thank you. So then we have a raised hand by Grandeep. So let me try to meet you. Uh, so I just wanted to ask this, that the problem that you look for was a personalization and classification. Uh, like, do you really expect that the same thing will work in other uh, applications also, like we have a uh, federated recommendation problem? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, um, yeah, classification is just one example. Uh, any learning problem, you, you will have, uh, I think, uh, so what, what's a specific application you have in mind? Oh, uh, like mainly this recommendation problem. Yeah. Like yeah, uh, personalized recommendation systems if we're building like, and we are using hyper networks for that. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, Accommodation system personalization is, you know, it's, it's really important, right? You want to personalize to your, to your clients. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Okay. It would be, it would be really interesting to see this approach extended to, yeah, to other problems. I think uh, could be promising. So maybe I would have then one extra question. Uh, so when you don't use actually personalization, do you think that uh, hyper networks can still actually bring some improvement over standard methods like Fed average. Oh, you, you mean in non-personalized? Yes, so, so you, you just, you trained uh, only single model, but you use this architecture that you propose with hyper networks. That it's actually the hyper networks that gives you the parameters. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. I, I, um, I don't see a reason why it would help. Um, I, I mean, it adds a lot of complexity, so it might be harder. Uh, this is this go back to your previous question about the, the engineering of the system. Uh, still, you need initialization. And everything's a bit more complex. Uh, I don't see a strong reason why Producing a model just using a using a, a single model would be would be better, but but that's that's, a, that's an interesting idea. Thank you. So please, if you have any other questions, just yeah, you can raise your hand or post a question to the chat. I guess we are actually uh, just out of time. Yeah, so we kind of like, we started for uh, like past five. So we still have like uh, two minutes, but it sure. seems there are, yeah. If there are no further questions. Yeah, thank you a lot, John. This was a really great talk and I really enjoyed that. Thank and you so much, it was, was fun. And thanks for the great questions and good luck with the rest of the series. Thank you a lot. And thanks everybody for tuning in today and so we continue next week and we have a scheduled talk same time next week by Amir Uman Sadr. So thank you a lot, everybody. Thank you a lot, Gal. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.